The story begins by introducing us to our protagonist, Matasuwa Hideki, an ordinary guy who works on his parents' farm to earn some extra money so he can attend his dream university. After finishing his work, he sees in the distance that the mailman has left a letter, which the boy already knows is a letter from the university he applied to. Upon opening it, he becomes upset when saw that he wasn't accepted, so he will have to wait until the next year to reapply to another university. However, he decides to apply to a different university because he doesn't want to miss the opportunity to study in Tokyo. Days later, the boy has left the farm to travel to Tokyo, arriving safely. While doing this, he encounters a Persicon, which is an intelligent female humanoid robot, much like Mega Man X if you ask me. The boy is amazed when he sees this robot up close for the first time. A little later, when he turns his gaze, he notices several Persicons displayed on a shelf. The boy is shocked when he sees their price because they are too expensive for his budget, which frustrates him and makes him start talking to himself. After this, the proto continues on his way searching the apartment, while thinking about how much he wishes to have a Persicon, and he not only thinks about it but also starts talking and shouting about the topic. Just at that moment, he is abruptly interrupted by a girl who is cleaning outside, causing the piece of paper with the apartment address to end up in her hands. Nervously, the boy asks her if she knows the address on the paper she's holding, to which she replies yes, because it's right in front of him. The girl then introduces herself to the boy as Hibia Chitos, the apartment's landlady. After the introductions, the girl takes Motasua to his room and welcomes him before saying goodbye and returning to her tasks. A little later, while the protagonist is arranging his things, there's a knock on his room door, and thinking it might be Hibia, upon opening the door, the boy is attacked by a tiny Persicon who congratulates him on the move and dances on his head. This is how we meet the owner of this Persicon, who is Shinbo Hiromu, and also Simono, his Persicon. After a long conversation about Persicons and their functions, it seems that these two boys will become good friends from now on, because they got along well the entire time they were talking. Following this, the protagonist goes to a store to buy some food, and he's surprised to find that Persicon is the one who is attending him. When he heads back home, the boy looks up the sky and talks about how much he wishes to have his own Persicon, as it would be very useful in his life, although he knows that if he does get one, he wouldn't know what to do with it. Just at that moment, the boy manages to spot the body of a young girl among the pile of trash which scares him a lot because he thinks it's the lifeless body of a girl. Consequently, he hides and contemplates whether he should call the police or an ambulance, but after closely examining the body, he realizes it's a Persicon because of her ears, so he decides to come out of hiding and head home. Before leaving the place completely, our protagonist's neurons make a connection, and he decides to take this Persicon with him, thinking that his wish was heard by the gods. However, things don't go smoothly for him because he had no idea that Persicons were so heavy. He uses all this strength to carry the Persicon to his home, ending up very tired on the way. In our protagonist's room, we see him trying to activate the Persicon, remembering the tips that Shimbo gave to him. But he only ends up getting stressed, because he can't find the Persicon's power switch anywhere. This leads the protagonist to briefly consider checking if the switch is located in the restricted areas of the Persicon, but he reconsiders and decides not to do it because he's not crazy. Despite this, seeing that he has no other option, the boy decides to quickly put his hand in the girl's pelvis, which finally awakens her. The girl levitates in the air and drops the bandages that covered her body, leaving her completely without anything covering her. This Persicon seems lost because she can only pronounce the word chi, and she doesn't appear to follow orders, so the protagonist can't control her as he wishes. After observing the boy for a while, the girl pounces on him, humming him and getting very close to him, making the boy feel lucky. But just at that moment, his friend Shinbo knocks on his room door, asking him to accompany him to the public restrooms. This causes the proto to panic because he doesn't want Shinbo to see his Persicon with the clothes, so he desperately searches for something to cover her, finding only a towel, which he quickly puts on her. Shinbo enters our protagonist's room and notices that he's acting strangely, bleeding and behaving oddly. Despite this, Shinbo decides to believe the boy's words and leaves, telling him that he'll be waiting in the hallway. After several attempts by our protagonist to prevent Shinbo from seeing his Persicon, he manages to make him leave. The boy is now relieved, but the peace won't last long because just as he was about to go out to meet Shimbo, Hibia appears, who came to his room just to give him some food. The proto thanks the landlady for the gift, and while bowing, the girl can see the Persocon behind him. This makes the boy nervous because he wonders what Hibia might think of him. However, she is just happy for him and bids farewell to both him and his Persocon. After this, the proto goes to find Shinbo to tell him that he won't be able to go to the restrooms with him. Upon returning to his room, the protagonist tries to talk to his Persicon but notices that she only says chi, so he asks her if she's broken, considering that he found her in the trash in the first place. These words makes the Persicon sad because she thinks her new owner will try to throw her away again, but the boy reassures her by saying that he plans to use her and give her a purpose in life. This makes the girl happy, so she hugs the boy tightly, leaving us with a rather heartwarming scene at the end. The next morning, we see our protagonist waking up and gets a big fright when he sees that she is beside him because for a moment he had forgotten that he adopted this Persicon the day before. 
Then they both have breakfast, and while they do this, Shinbo enters the boy's room without warning, realizing that his friend now has his own Persicon. Like Hibia, Shinbo doesn't make much of a fuss about it. In fact, he helps our protagonist understand how Persicons work. After running a test on the television, Shinbo tells the protagonist that she is missing the operating system, which is the crucial part for the Persicon to function because without it, it would just be a mannequin. This surprises him because Chi can move even without an installed operating system. So Shinbo starts searching for Chi's serial number all over her body, or at least the name of her creator, although he goes overboard in the process, to the point that our protagonist becomes jealous. In the end, Stomomo is the one who ends up conducting the analysis. After a few seconds, this May Persokan breaks down because it couldn't handle the power of Chi's CPU, and its owner ends up crying as he realizes that his Persokan will no longer be by his side. Because of this, Shinbo advises the protagonist to visit a friend of his who is an expert in Persicans, so he writes down the address he should go to on a piece of paper. Upon arriving at the place, the boy is greeted by several beautiful maids, which causes him to have a nosebleed at the sight of them. After this, we meet the owner of this luxurious place who is Minoru Kokubunji, a boy who is passionate about creating his own Persokans to the point that his entire family is composed of Persokans. After the maids swarm our protagonist, she mimics their actions, causing Minoru to notice how peculiar this Persokan is. So he takes her away to examine her. Minoru connects several of his Persokans to Chi in an attempt to determine her model, but again, none of them can handle the power of her processor. Just when everything seems lost, Yuzuki, a special maid Persokan of Minoru, arrives and offers to help them understand how Chi works. In the end, Yuzuki's results indicate that Chi doesn't have any issues, and she is in such good condition that there are no flaws in her operating system. The only thing she seems to have is a built-in locking or sealing system that prevents her from accessing all her functions. With this in mind, Minoru concludes that they are dealing with Chabot, a legendary Persokan, in other words, a robot that is conscious and moves of its own will despite having the functions of a normal Persokan installed. Although the idea of a legendary Persokan is just an internet myth, Minoru is not entirely sure if this is the case, so for now, our protagonist will have to wait for Minoru to investigate further before a solution can be found for his Persokan's problem. Minoru says goodbye to the boy but asks for his email or contact information so that they can stay in touch. The protagonist gives him his phone number, but Minoru tells him to say it out loud so that Yuzuki can hear it and store it in her data. While the boy dictates his number, Minoru notices that she is listening as well. After the protagonist finishes saying his number, Minoru asks him to instruct Chi to repeat it, and to his surprise, Chi is finally able to speak. This satisfies Minoru as he has verified that Chi's learning system or software works well. He asked our protagonist to teach more things to his Persicon to give her a meaningful existence while he continues researching her. Thanks to this, our protagonist regains some hope in Chi, so he says his goodbyes and leaves the place. But before closing the door, Minoru whispers in his ear, warning him to be very careful about developing romantic feelings for his Persicon as they are still robots. He also warns that he could suffer greatly if he becomes romantically interested in a Persicon. These words leave our protagonist deep in thought as he returns home, but after a while, he decides not to dwell on them and focuses on what to teach Chi first. Upon arriving at the apartment, the boy is greeted by Hibia, who gives him some clothes to dress his Persicon in a slightly more feminine style. The young man thanks her and goes to his room. Once inside, he gives the clothes to Chi, but she undresses in front of him, making him nervous and looking away. After the girl changes, our protagonist decides to teach Chi something for the first time. So he teaches her to say her name, which will be Chi, as it's obvious, since it's the only thing this robot can pronounce. It's another day, and our protagonist shows us that his financial situation is not very stable, since he barely managed to cover this month's expenses. To make matters worse, he still has to study hard, because otherwise all the sacrifices he made to get to where he is now will have been in vain. Nevertheless, there is something notable about this young man, and that is he never wears a frown in the face of problems. He is content with what little he has, especially now that he has a Persicon to teach whatever he desires, which is the pinnacle of happiness for him. Later, we see our protagonist at school with Shinbo, who cheerfully informs him that he was able to fix Simono, putting the protagonist at ease. Then, Takako Shimizu, his new teacher, arrives and upon seeing her, our young man becomes happy and blushes as he considers her a beautiful woman. He daydreams about various scenarios where she tends to him. After classes, the protagonist sets out to find a job to make ends meet. Unfortunately, luck is not on his side as he cannot find one. Everywhere he inquires, he's told that they've already hired someone else, or that they only hire Persicans because they have replaced humans in almost all jobs. All of this makes the young man realize the harsh reality of Tokyo. Just then, a girl accidentally spills water on him, dirtying his clothes and putting him in an awkward situation. After talking for a while, she suggests that our protagonist enter her store and wait while she washes his clothes. She also gives him the official uniform of the place. This girl is Yumi Omura, younger than him, 
who works at her father's restaurant. While she goes to wash the young man's clothes, she provides him with the restaurant's uniform so he can walk around without worry, as others will know he works there. Everything seems normal until, while he's talking to a Persicon, one of the restaurant employees asks him to help tidy up the place. The young man does an excellent job and becomes the fastest worker there. When the boss enters, he is surprised to see the young man and goes to talk to him. Before the boss can praise the protagonist for his work, Yumi appears to explain the situation to her father and also hands the young man his dry and clean clothes. As a result of the conversation between the boss and the protagonist about his situation, the boss decides to hire him since he is quite pleased with the work he accomplished in such a short time. The protagonist shakes hands with his new boss, and after the boss leaves, he reflects on how he won't be poor anymore as he has secured a job where he will not only earn enough money to survive the month but also spend more time with a beautiful girl like Yumi. For this reason, the two of them engage in conversation to get to know each other better. To formalize his employment, the protagonist needs to provide his resume, but he confesses to Yumi that he has never made one since he used to work from home. She offers to help him create one. After the young man finishes making his resume, he thanks Yumi for her assistance, and she calls him Senpei, which makes him nervous. She explains that she called him that because he is older than her, which calms him down. It's nighttime, and the protagonist finally returns to his apartment. Upon entering, he tries to tell Chi that he has finally found a job, but she doesn't understand what he means. As a result, the young man attempts to teach Chi various things, but he doesn't make much progress. To change the subject, he goes to cook something but ends up more stressed than before because Chi keeps repeating everything he says. This gesture motivates our protagonist to want to do something for her. So he decides to use some of the money he earned on his first day of work to buy some underwear for his Persicon. However, he ends up running out of the clothing store because he can't bring himself to ask for such items as a guy as it generates anxiety for him. Later at home, our young man is visited by Shinbo, who has been keeping an eye on the whole situation regarding Chi's clothing. Seeing that the protagonist can't enter women's stores due to embarrassment, Shimbo suggests that Chi and Sumomo go shopping together to make it less awkward for everyone. Of course, before that, the protagonist has to teach Chi what underwear is so there won't be any misunderstandings when they go shopping. The day arrives when our Chi will go shopping with Sumomo, while the protagonist and Shimbo have to attend classes. While at first it seems like Chi is adapting well to walking on the street, problems arise after a while. Since this is Chi's first time exploring the world, several inconveniences occur such as her stopping in front of a truck with underwear logos or attempting to lift a student's skirt who happened to be nearby. Additionally, she asks about everything she sees, making the shopping trip much longer than anticipated. As expected, our protagonist becomes so worried that he leaves class early to search for Chi throughout the city, knowing that something must have happened to her. After searching for a while, he finally finds Chi, who is exploring the city and learning new things alongside Sumomo. Furthermore, the young man is surprised to notice that his Persicon is applying everything he had taught her, he puts his worry aside for a moment but still decides to watch the girls from a distance to see what else they do. After a few hours, the Persicans finally arrive at the clothing store, the protagonist still observing them from afar, when he notices that she is being cornered by all the other women because the store manager opened his sales section, the young man decides to rescue her from the crowd. Unfortunately, the girl accuses him of being mean to her, and the security guards take him away to cure him of his illness. As a result, the young man couldn't find out whether Chi managed to buy her underwear or if she was crushed by the crowd. Fortunately, we were the only ones who witnessed this incident, and it turns out that because all the women's underwear was sold out due to the low prices, Chi could only buy men's underwear. At nightfall, we see the protagonist return home with a slightly bruised face from the confrontation with the security guards. Upon entering his room, he asks Chi if she was able to get her underwear, to which she responds by showing men's underwear. This disappoints our young man, but not wanting his Persicon to feel bad, he decides to tell her she did a good job. The next day, our young man gathers his courage and goes to the clothing store to ask for women's underwear for Chi. In the end, he manages to get it, despite all the embarrassment he goes through. Finally, he returns home and gives the underwear to Chi, who calls him crazy. Hearing his owner call himself that, she repeats it like a parrot, causing our protagonist to cover his ears and feel embarrassed. The next morning in class, we see the teacher telling the students to prepare themselves as the first practice exams for university entrance are approaching. After conveying this, she leaves since it's the end of the class, so our protagonist and Shinbo also leave. Clearly, this was going to make things a bit challenging for our young man because remember that he just started working at Yumi's father's restaurant this week, and with everything that had happened in the previous days, he hadn't had time to study. Additionally, after work, he goes straight to sleep. For this reason, while talking to Yumi, he tells her that he will take the next day off so that he can study and concentrate as much as possible. As night falls, our young man returns home after his work shift, and as soon as he enters, he is greeted with a hug from Chi, which makes him happy. After this, he gets down to business and starts studying with the help of his Persocon, of course. Although she doesn't help much, she's not a burden to him. 
but rather a pleasant presence. We can see that the protagonist is highly motivated and eager to learn, which gives us the impression that he has a chance to pass the exam. If he believes in himself that he will pass the exam, why shouldn't we? As the hours pass, the protagonist realizes that he is missing his English dictionary, and after remembering where it is, he receives the bad news that he left it at his parents' country house. As a result, the young man decides to lie on the floor and try to de-stress, with Chi imitating him. The next day, our young man, along with Chi, decides to go to a bookstore to buy the elusive English dictionary, so he can continue studying. After he picks up the book, he goes to pay for it, but then he notices that Chi is interested in a children's book among the pile. Even though it's from the children's section and only contains pictures, it's something new for her since this is the first time we see her taking an interest in something. Our young man is indecisive about whether to buy the book or not because all the books are expensive. However, in the end, he decides to buy it as a gift for Chi, which means he has to set aside the English dictionary. That afternoon, we see both of them sitting on the floor reading the children's story that Chi chose, which is called The City Where Nobody Lives. After a while, Shinbo arrives in the protagonist's room, wanting to check if he's studying. Upon noticing that he's just wasting time, Shimbo asks if he plans to study or not. Hearing this, our young man suddenly remembers that he needs to study, as he had spent the entire afternoon reading the children's story with Chi and had forgotten about his exams. He confesses to Shinbo that he left his dictionary at his parents' house. Without much fuss, Shinbo tells him that he'll lend him his dictionary so he can study peacefully, but asks the protagonist to come to his room. Shortly after this conversation, the protagonist and Shinbo find themselves in the room studying diligently, while on the other hand, we see Chi left alone in our protagonist's room. She starts reading the story on her own, which is summarized briefly as about a girl who dreamed of finding her true love. However, she had a problem. If she ever found that special someone, all she would achieve is to hurt him because her destiny was to suffer for love. After our protagonist returns home from a long study session, he finds Chi in a kind of suspended state, as her body is glowing brightly and slightly levitating. Seeing this, the young man becomes very concerned because it's the first time he has seen her like this. He doesn't know what to do and decides to ask Shinbo to check his Persicon to see if it malfunctioned or something similar. After Shinbo tells the protagonist that she is in good condition, he relaxes and goes back home. However, due to everything that happened, he plans to stop studying for the night and take a break. But before he can do that, she tries to motivate our young man not to give up and to give his best efforts during the remaining hours before the practice exams. She succeeds in getting our protagonist to start studying again, this time for real. The next morning, the protagonist wakes up before Chi and prepares breakfast, although he doesn't finish eating because he's running late for school. Before leaving home, he notices that Chi is acting strange. She appears dispirited and lifeless. He wants to try to help her, although he can't quite figure out how. He tells Chi that after classes, he will return with Shinbo's assistance. In class, we see that our protagonist did indeed arrive late. To avoid any punishment from the teacher, he tries to sneak in, but she catches him in the act. As punishment, she tells him to run 10 laps around the schoolyard, to which the young man obediently complies without complaint. However, before he starts running, the teacher tells him it was just a joke, but appreciates his innocent obedience. After classes, the protagonist plans to talk to Shinbo about Chi and her current condition. Shinbo explains something so basic that the protagonist didn't know until now about Persokans. It turns out that these robots need to recharge from time to time, but not in the traditional way. They recharge through solar energy because it's normal for a Persokan to be outside engaging in human activities, not cooped up inside the house. This is when our young man realizes that Chi being confined to her room doesn't receive enough sunlight to recharge her energy. Fortunately, Sumomo provides a solution to this problem, which involves using the cable that all Persokans have inside their ears to recharge Chi without her having to leave the house. However, he needs an adapter for this, which he doesn't have. Once again, Shinbo comes to the rescue and lends him one. On the way, he runs into Yui, who asks if he's heading to work. He tells her that he's actually going home because he has some things to take care of and won't be able to go to work. However, Chi says that a worker can't just take the day off and that he should go to work. When he arrives at work, he realizes that he has a lot to do. Our protagonist simply hopes to finish as quickly as possible because he doesn't want Chi to run out of power completely. As Yubin falls, the young man returns home after his long day at work. Upon entering, he sees that Chi, unfortunately, is completely out of energy. When he tries to plug her in using the earplug, all he manages to do is cause a blackout throughout the neighborhood. Due to this, our protagonist tries to find someone to help with the situation, but it seems that both Hibiyat and Shimbo are not at the apartment tonight. So our poor protagonist has to figure out how to solve this problem on his own. He decides to carry Chi and take her to a place where she can charge, specifically thinking of his workplace. Our protagonist with Chi on his back goes as fast as he can, but he encounters several obstacles on the way such as blocked paths. When he encounters a large wall in his way, the only option he has is to climb it. Upon reaching the top, he ends up falling from a great height. The young man is injured from the fall, but that's the least of his concerns. He's worried about Chi. 
who is now practically unresponsive. Just as he's about to pick her up, Hibia appears. She happened to be passing by in a taxi and saw him fall. Without further ado, she decides to help them and takes them to her home to finally resolve the protagonist's problems. The downside of all of this is that, while charging Chi, energy meter was increasing at an astonishing speed. As expected, our protagonist will have to pay for all this electricity consumption. However, curiously, Hibia tells him that he doesn't need to worry about it. She will take care of that matter. What he can't escape, though, is paying the rent, which leaves our young man feeling down as he realizes he will have to work hard to cover it. However, things start to improve for the protagonist the next day. After having a vivid dream involving Yumi, Hibia, and Shimizu, she greets him with the news that she wants to start working. Although he hadn't seen much progress in her software development so far, she had been learning a lot on her own and alongside the protagonist. One of the things she learned was the concept of earning money through hard work and responsibility. Initially, our protagonist was hesitant about giving Chi this freedom to explore the world and work independently. But everything changes when he realizes that she is serious about it. She genuinely wants to be useful to society and has even researched a couple of job openings where she can work without the risk of accidents. However, the problem is that Chi leaves without the protagonist's permission. Moreover, she encounters a rather odd character on the street who at first mistakes her for a real person, but later finds out she is a persicum looking for work. This man offers to take her to a place where she will be paid very well, as he claims. After a few hours, two things are shown. On one hand, we have our protagonist who gets overly excited because Yumi has invited him to dinner at her house. On the other hand, Minoru, who was conducting his research on the Chabits, manages to find a photo of Chi on a website. Without thinking twice, he tries to trace the transmission address with the help of Yuzuki. Once they have confirmed the transmission address, they decide to notify Shinbo via an email sent through Sumomo so they can tell the protagonist. When Shinbo hears the email read by Sumomo, he finds it very strange that his friend would allow Chi to do that kind of work. He quickly rushes to the restaurant to inform him that someone is taking advantage of Chi's innocence. Despite the fact that our protagonist was in the middle of dinner with Yui, he decides to leave her waiting and runs as fast as he can to reach the location where Chi is at that moment, fearing that something worse might happen to her. Back to Chi's situation, it becomes apparent that her learning period has served her well. Just as the video she was involuntarily recording was about to get more explicit, something inside her stops her. We can even hear a voice telling her that what she is doing is wrong and that such things should only be done in private with the person she chooses to love. Nevertheless, the man recording her is not interested in her internal conflict and proceeds to enter the room and touch her body against her will to create content for his website. Ironically, this backfires on him as it appears that she has a self-defense system built into her. The moment she senses any kind of threat or danger, triggers a bright explosion of light, alerting everyone that she is in danger and needs help. When the protagonist arrives at the building, all he finds is pure destruction in his path and he sees Chi perched on a lamppost as he exits the building. At the same time, something strange happens because for some reason, all the Persicons around him and throughout the city, including Sumomo, who was accompanying him, freeze for a while. However, the only thing our protagonist cares about is reaching Chi. Without dwelling on the matter, he starts running around until he finally manages to bring her down from the heights and carry her in his arms back home. For those wondering, after they reunite, the machines in the area resume normal operation. However, as no one really knew what happened, they decided to leave it as a bad experience from that eerie night. The next morning, they discussed Chi's job, which she had accepted. As we saw, it was not a good situation, and although her gesture of trying to help with their financial situation is appreciated, risking her life and well-being for a few bills is not right. Nevertheless, she remains interested in finding a way to work. To avoid crushing her hopes, the protagonist tells her to wait a few days while he finds a safe job where she won't be taken advantage of because of her innocent appearance. With this plan in mind, after classes, our protagonist goes to the restaurant to apologize to Yumi for standing her up and, in passing, informs her about his plan to find a safe job for Chi, one that won't involve dealing with customers or sketchy individuals trying to take advantage of her innocence. In summary, for its fifth anniversary, a nearby cafe is looking for a girl to dress as a maid and give out welcome gifts, which is perfect for Chi to utilize her beauty without the need to compromise herself. The good news is that she does her role so well that Hiroyasu Ida, her new boss, hires her permanently to help with the business's image and customer service. This news makes Chi very happy. Later that same day, when the protagonist goes to pick her up from work, she shares all the updates with him and shows him the envelope with her earnings. At first, she wanted to give it all to Hideko. But that's when he teaches her that from now on, everything she earns through her efforts is hers to spend as she sees fit, whether on both of them, or on things she fancies in the city. It's entirely her decision now. With these words, we see that the morning after, she decides to use her first paycheck to buy a gift for the protagonist, something that might seem strange, but comes from the heart. She's so determined to do this that she goes to the library on her own to find a magazine that the protagonist might like. 
While all of this is happening, on the other hand, the protagonist and Shinbo go together to take a bath at the nearby hot springs near their residence. It's here that we learn that, just like humans, Persokens need to shower from time to time as their bodies are designed with the same concept of hygiene as humans. The issue is that since she doesn't know how to shower by herself, the protagonist's options are narrowed down to two. The first is to teach her how to do it so she can do it on her own, or the second is to buy the software so that her system learns the process and can replicate it whenever necessary. Obviously, neither of these is a good idea for someone like the protagonist. However, given the circumstances, he doesn't have extra money to spend on expensive programs, so he has no choice but to enter the shower with her and teach her what to do in that situation. Later that same day, the two return home and before the protagonist can broach the topic of the shower, she surprises him with the gift she bought, which in summary is an adult magazine of the kind he likes. Besides this, we see that among her belongings is the second part of the book, the city where nobody lives, but we'll get to that later because first, we move on to the part about teaching her how to take a shower. With no other options available, the proto goes to Shinbo once again to see if they can find the necessary software for free or maybe a pirated version, but to his bad luck, they don't find either, and they're essentially back to the same problem they started with. However, as she goes to work normally the next morning, we can put this aside for a while and jump directly to the unexpected meeting that Manoru urgently requested with the protagonist. It turns out that in the midst of his research, on one of the forums where he's registered, some anonymous sources provided him with a photograph of a Chobit model that looks identical to Chi. However, as this version has a rather shady appearance, the protagonist completely dismisses the possibility that it's the same cute and kind Persikan he has at home. To avoid being disrespectful, he decides to leave the cafe and head back to his apartment, where the mission of teaching a robot how to shower still awaits him. Of course, this mission goes terribly wrong because despite Chi perfectly imitating the protagonist in everything that should be done in a public bath, she makes the huge mistake of entering the men's section instead of the women's. Luckily, when Hibiya arrives at the place, she offers to help Chi with the bathing process and later that same day, she hands the poor protagonist a clean and beautiful Chi who had him running out of ideas. Now back to the Chabit issue, to get to the bottom of it, we see that the protagonist shows Chi the photograph of the modified Persokan with the intention of seeing if she recognizes herself or remembers anything from her previous owners. Although Chi seemed a bit lost at first when looking at the image, after a few minutes she completely denies that it's her, and with that, the protagonist decides not to dwell on the matter any longer and leaves it at that, assuming it's just a well-edited photo. As that is a thing of the past, the next morning brings some good news for our protagonist, which essentially is a date with Yumi go see a movie together. The thing is, since our protagonist is inexperienced with women and has no clue what to do in these situations, he once again goes to Shinbo for advice. Without much thought, Shinbo tells him that the best thing he can do is not change his personality and try to be himself at all times. With this in mind, the protagonist gets all dressed up and heads straight to his date. However, we won't see that just yet. First, we continue reading the second part of the story, the city where nobody lives, she opens the book and begins to narrate the rest of the story, which is about how this character began to understand human feelings but also had to deal with an internal struggle between herself and her other self, who didn't quite grasp what it meant to love someone. Although once again this doesn't seem to have much relevance to Chi, we soon see that it directly describes her life because at that moment, she feels like a voice is calling her. Here, we finally get to know the appearance of this strange being. To make it easier to understand, just like in the book, this other version of Chi is a part of her, but for now, they are separated, with each representing an aspect of her personality that has been hidden due to past experiences. Both of them converse about recent events, especially regarding the protagonist. It seems this new girl doubts that he is the right person to safeguard her body. As a final message, she tells Chi that she will find her soon, and it's only a matter of time before they are reunited. While all of this is happening back with the protagonist, surprisingly, his date is going extremely well. Following Shinbo's advice to the letter so far, Yumi is more than delighted to spend time with him. However, as not everything can go perfectly, we soon see that in an attempt to catch up to Minoru, who happened to also be in the park, a protagonist falls into the water, soaking his clothes and ruining the boat ride he had planned for the date. Despite the mishap, Minoru tells him he's proud that he's fallen in love with a real girl and not someone like Chi, as he had previously warned that relationships between machines and humans would only bring problems in the future. The protagonist, upon hearing this, discreetly asks Minoru why he's so afraid of being in relationships with Persicans when he's surrounded by them and even has one personalized to his specifications. With no other choice, Minoru confesses that Yuzuki is very special because she's actually the representation of his deceased older sister. However, he admits that despite working for years on creating software that replicates his dear sister's feelings, he has not succeeded. He acknowledges that in the end, these machines are just that, machines without their own hearts. These words linger in the protagonist's mind, and he couldn't even finish his date, to the point that Yumi left without saying goodbye, feeling uncomfortable in that moment. 
A couple of days later, on a night like any other, we see that the protagonist is on his way home after buying some things at the store. However, to his misfortune, at that moment, something very eerie returned from the past to seek revenge. To make it easier to understand, some time ago, a crazy man had sent his wife to the afterlife. As the story goes, since this woman's body was brutally mutilated, her soul was said to wander in that place, seeking to take with her the person who had tortured her. The unfortunate part is that all of this happened in the apartment where the protagonist and Shinbo live. For this reason, our protagonist becomes extremely frightened when he sees that the lights in the room where the crime occurred are flickering in the same way it happened that night. Ironically, this is just a horror story that Yuzuki told them while Minoru was diagnosing Chi. However, our protagonist took it very personally, and now he's experiencing some strange hallucinations that make him excessively paranoid. Even days after that night, despite trying to clear his mind at work and spending time with Yumi, these thoughts wouldn't leave his head, to the point where he began having disturbing nightmares while sleeping. From here on, what we can see is quite confusing, as it's a mix of his own imaginations with fragments of reality, also intermingled with parts of this horror story. To simplify things, let's leave it at that. The protagonist is paranoid and traumatized by the legend of Room 114. In case you're wondering, in the end, his friends went to his apartment to show him that there was nothing there, and that everything he was seeing was merely Hibia making some repairs to the room. Furthermore, the room in question wasn't even Room 114 in the story. In this place, the rooms start counting from 112. Now back in reality, a couple of weeks after all this misunderstanding, Yubi's father gives our protagonist a video player so he can watch the movies he likes, whether they are action films or adult movies. This is a little gift he gives for the great job he has done over these months. The funny part is that at the store, our guy runs into Minoru, who, even though he stops him at the best part of his purchase, at least gives him an online video game that he can play with Chi through her system. With this in mind, he invites Chi to play some rounds of the game when they get home. However, to their misfortune before entering the server, they are hit with an announcement that they need to have a console user account first. As our guy has no clue about this, he decides to call Minoru to ask about the login. In short, to get started, you first need an email account, something that, as mentioned before, the protagonist doesn't have because he doesn't even know how to create one. The funny thing is that despite spending a lot of hours trying to create an account, he doesn't make any progress in the end. So once again, he has to turn to Shinbo, who, with Sumomo's help, is the perfect dude for solving all sorts of problems. As expected, with their extensive knowledge of technology, they finally managed to set up the device. To celebrate this achievement, our guy invites Shinbo to play for a while as a token of gratitude for all the saves they've done for him so far. However, as the three of them successfully enter the server, she isn't so lucky as she ends up lost in the network, generating her in a different part of the game. As you can imagine, the guys enter the typical open-world game where each has their own character with roles and abilities, along with a lot of monsters and bosses to defeat to complete their missions. Obviously, our protagonist doesn't care about the game, as he's more concerned about finding Chi than exploring the world. The good thing is that eventually, the rest of their friends join the game, and together, they try to conduct Amiga exploration to see if she's anywhere in the town or in an unknown area. Unfortunately, despite spending hours walking among slimes, dragons, and other creatures, they couldn't find Chi in any of these places. In the end, all they can do is disconnect from the server and manually retrieve her. Back in the real world, our protagonist manages to recover Chi, who is somewhat disappointed that she couldn't enter the game. She asks if another day with a little more time they can try playing together so they don't miss out on exploring the wonders of this world. Without thinking twice, the protagonist agrees. However, it turns out that this might not have been such a good idea, as he overlooked the fact that he still has to work and attend classes. Otherwise, he won't be able to enter the university, and worse yet, won't have the money to pay the rent for the month. The bad part is that since she takes the game seriously and wants to play again, our protagonist has no choice but to summon energy from where he doesn't have any and log into the server to play for a couple of hours until they get bored. Unfortunately, she couldn't connect to the network again, so once more, our protagonist and Minoru had to try to solve Chi's connection problem and see if they could find her in the places they haven't visited yet, namely, the strongest dungeons in the game. As expected in the game, the three of them get annihilated by the final boss of the castle since it was all very sudden, and none of them had the necessary equipment to face it. However, as crazy as it may sound and just at the last second, she appears as a super strong and beautiful goddess and defeats the boss who had finished off her friends with a single attack. The funny part is that back in reality, she doesn't remember any of this, so to avoid more problems in the future, the protagonist decides it's best to play a different game that isn't online, but they'll do that another day. Because apparently for being absent-minded and not paying attention in class, we find out after a couple of weeks that our protagonist failed all of his practice exams. In the midst of this bad news, since his friends are the best thing he has in his life, Shinbo organizes a mini-beach trip for them during a summer vacation, where literally all the girls our protagonist knows will be going. Although it's somewhat illogical for our guy to go on a trip when he still has to study to improve his grades, there's actually a hidden purpose behind all of this that we'll discover later. 
For now, let's enjoy the sea, the women in swimsuits, and the good experiences of a trip with friends. Just as a side note, our protagonist didn't have to pay anything for this trip, as they will be staying at Shumizu's beach house these days. The reason she invited them to spend the vacation with her, in short, is to have fun during the day and study like crazy at night. Now with things clear, the next morning, Minoru, who was also invited by the teacher, lends them his private yacht so they can get up close and personal with the dolphins. Because apparently, our protagonist doesn't know how to swim, and what's worse, he's even afraid of the water. However, he quickly has to face his limits because when she is impressed by seeing how these creatures swim, she jumps into the water without hesitation to try to imitate them. But the problem is that Persicans tend to sink when the water is too deep. As soon as he hears this, our protagonist jumps into the sea, and although we don't know exactly how he manages it, he suddenly reaches Chi, who ironically ends up saving him in the end. But what's important here is not that, but rather the fact that she felt this emotion of concern for our guy. Remember that from any point of view, Chi is still a machine, or at least that that's what we thought until now, because not only did we see that she didn't get a single drop of water into her system when she jumped into the sea, but she was also able to express a human emotion, something that in theory, should be impossible for any normal Persicon. This is how, with this strange event, we conclude the mini beach trip, which to our protagonist's misfortune, didn't have the desired effect as his grades drop even further. To top it off, the summer heat makes the situation even worse. In the midst of this unfortunate situation, destiny once again favors our guy, as just when the day was about to end, at the last moment, Shimizu arrives at his apartment to ask for a place to stay for the night. Obviously, at first our guy gets a bit nervous, because all things considered, she is still a woman and he is a complete loser. However, he quickly gets over it because he realizes that this situation is much more serious than it appears. While the two of them have some alcoholic drinks, a teacher confesses that her dream has always been to be a primary school teacher, but she could never apply for that profession because apparently her husband disagreed with the idea of her taking care of children, who aren't their own. In case you're wondering, Shimizu is married, but she says she won't be for much longer, as she implies there is a certain problem in her relationship, which may be related to a bad experience with a Persicon. However, that night, nothing happens except for a very adult game, which becomes increasingly difficult to keep up with due to all the alcohol the teacher consumed. So to avoid dwelling on that, let's move on to the next morning when the two of them head to school. What's interesting is that at the school, when our protagonist tells Shinmo what happened yesterday, the guy becomes very upset with him, to the point that he doesn't speak to him all day because of how shocked he was to hear about this. However, by evening, we understand a bit more about the reason for his anger. On the way back home, since our guy left later than usual, he randomly runs into Shumizu. Only this time, she is being embraced by a man. After paying a bit more attention, our guy realizes that this man is actually Shinbo, who, to everyone's surprise, is in a romantic relationship with their teacher. He not only tells her that he loves her, but also kisses her in the middle of the street. Starting from that night, things started to get even crazier because the next morning, Sumomo appeared out of nowhere in the protagonist's backpack with a note in which, in summary, she was left in his care for a few months while some personal matters were resolved. Furthermore, during classes, we find out that Shimizu also requested an indefinite leave from the institute, citing a family problem as the reason. By this point, it's very obvious that this is all a lie, and in reality, these two have run away together to continue enjoying their affair. Later that same day, Shimbo makes a video call where he confirms everything we were suspecting, but at the same time, he proceeds to tell us the whole truth about why he did this with his teacher. In short, as we already know, she was married, but unfortunately, her husband fell in love with her Persicon, and their relationship gradually deteriorated, until one day, he kicked her out of their home and ended their marriage without telling her anything. The thing is, it was that afternoon when Shimbo learned about all of this, and it was also where these forbidden feelings between both of them began to emerge. Although it was initially challenging to help Shimizu overcome the trauma of being replaced by a machine, after much effort, they managed to somewhat formalize a hidden relationship, and this is where the escape plan comes into play. Shimbo's goal is to spend a few months alone with her and at some point, find the perfect moment to propose marriage so that he can leave the past behind and above all, understand that he is very different from the man who didn't appreciate her. Obviously, the journey won't be easy because in the end it's still a very difficult relationship to navigate. Nevertheless, Shimbo believes that this time his heart will be able to teach him that love knows no bounds when it's real. With not much else to say, Shimbo ends the call, and our protagonist returns home still in shock from the news they just received. As the days go by, things only get worse for him. Not only have his grades dropped, but he's also somewhat worried because he feels that with everything that has happened recently, it's becoming increasingly clear that he doesn't yet have a clear direction in his life, and he has been wasting his time so far. The good thing is that once again, he finds the energy he didn't know he had, and with a smile on his face, he decides to follow his teacher's advice about taking the national exam to measure his true potential in a real test. Without further ado, we see our protagonist getting to work, and despite having to study in the morning and work in the afternoon, he keeps pushing himself to fulfill his dream of studying in Tokyo. 
He's so motivated that even one night when he wanted to buy some food and unfortunately dropped his wallet, he found something positive in that mishap. Thanks to this incident, he realizes that he has a lot of good people around him, such as Chi, who offers him her savings so he can buy his dinner. As expected, the protagonist projects her offer once again because, in the end, that money still belongs to her. But the beautiful thing is that Chi decides to sneak away secretly so that, at least, she can prepare his lunch for the next day. Obviously, all the food she bought ends up burning because she still doesn't know how to cook, but the good thing is that Hibia appears to help her. In a very touching scene, we see Chi giving her all to prepare a decent meal for the protagonist. She explains that seeing the protagonist so focused, especially working so hard to achieve his dreams, motivates something inside her to also strive to be useful. This leaves us with a beautiful statement. If he has no strength, she loses her strength, but likewise, if he is happy, she is happy to have him by her side. It's from here that it becomes more noticeable that she might indeed have her own consciousness, as even days after all of this, when she sees Hibia cleaning the place, she volunteers to return the favor of the cooking lessons. The protagonist and Sumomo join this plan, but since nothing interesting happened during the cleaning, let's skip directly to the biggest revelation about Chi's past. To make it easier to understand, once everyone finished cleaning the courtyard, Hibia tells Chi to come over to her apartment to give her a dress that she has kept exclusively for her. At first, everything seemed normal as it was just an ordinary dress. But everything changes when she tells us that it was the clothing that belonged to her when they first met, and she is very glad that she has finally managed to return it. The problem is that in the end, we can't quite understand what she means by those words because while all of this was happening, our protagonist accidentally enters a room full of cables and unintentionally causes a sudden short circuit in Sumomo, which interrupts the revelation. However, it's in these moments of crisis where we discover a side of Hibia that we hadn't seen before. As soon as she sees our protagonist desperate to try and fix Sumomo, she tells him to hand her over so she can get to work on her repair. As funny as it may seem, she literally only needed the keyboard from an old computer to make Sumomo as good as new. This is where we learn that in the past, Hibia worked on developing Persicans, but after a few years, she decided to quit and dedicate herself to taking care of her late husband's residence. Incidentally, he also worked alongside her on this project. Now that we have a clear picture, we can return to the topic of the revelation. At the same time, Hibia tells us that there is still someone looking for Chi to take her away. We see another part of the city where some men dressed in black have activated a tracker that is pinpointing the location of their residence. Before explaining all of this, let's first go to the following day where on her way to work, she goes to the store to buy the third part of her favorite book. In that, out of nowhere, someone approaches her from behind and kidnaps her amidst the crowd without a trace. Obviously, the protagonist had no idea about this, and it's not until he returns home that he realizes something is wrong. Just to confirm his suspicions, the bakery owner calls him to ask why Chi didn't come to work. Without thinking twice, our protagonist goes out in the middle of the night to search the entire neighborhood. But no matter how hard he tries, he can't find any significant clues to discover Chi's whereabouts. Now back with her, we see that poor Chi wakes up in an unknown bed alongside a small persokan named Kotoko, who is only there to remind her that she's been kidnapped. The important part happens when Yoshiki Kojima enters. He's a technology enthusiast who has been following Chi for a long time, and it seems he needs her to uncover all the secrets of the first real Chabot. However, before delving further into this, we see that many things are happening at the same time, such as Hibiya entering her underground room with a lot of screens again, or that the Promita is using Sumomo to contact Minoru and inform him of the situation. For now, let's focus on this latest detail as the protagonist meets up with Minoru to see if they can figure out Chi's whereabouts together. Although after a few hours, they do come to a somewhat decent conclusion, the final news is not as positive as they hoped. In summary, Yuzuki tells them that perhaps the kidnapper is the same person who sent them the photograph of the modified Persicon, and it's most likely that he is also responsible for the internet rumors about the creation of the first Chabot. Upon hearing this, the protagonist realizes that this theory makes a lot of sense. Regardless, he decides to venture out into the streets once more, hoping for a miracle. And fortunately, it seems like his wish is granted as he finds Chi in a back alley. However, his luck doesn't hold, and despite a co-worker joining the search, they calm the city without success. Eventually, frustration overwhelms the protagonist, who collapses in the middle of the street out of fear of not knowing what else to do to find Chi. The good news is that Hiroyasu, upon seeing this, decides to share his story to try to calm him down. It turns out that Hiroyasu also had a past involving Persokans, and he fell in love at first sight, leading to marriage and the determination to live a happy life together despite societal norms at the time. He confesses that it wasn't societal pressure or a memory loss disease that separated them, but rather an act that showed Hiroyasu that Persokans also have hearts. One night, when he was told that his girl had lost all her memories, she saved him from a traffic accident, sacrificing herself to save the man she loved. This traumatic yet profound experience convinced Hiroyasu that machines could indeed feel. That's why he has been doing everything in his power to reunite the protagonist and Chi. 
However, there are many people around him who don't want this reunion to happen, and among them is Yumi. We see that Yumi had been secretly listening to Huryasu's story all this time. For some reason that we don't fully understand yet, when we approach her, we see her eyes fill with tears. Nevertheless, we will delve into their past later. While all this is happening, it quickly shows that Minoru received an encrypted message containing what appears to be a map with Chi's location. Despite Yuzuki's warning that all of this seems too convenient to be real, Minoru deciphers the codes and provides coordinates to the protagonist and Shimbo. By the way, upon hearing about the disappearance and kidnapping, Shimbo decided to set aside his small honeymoon and come to help his best friend. With the exact address, the boys use Sumomo as a GPS and run to the building. Meanwhile, she has already been connected to a lot of cables, which are, in fact, Persokan's designed specifically to analyze her. The catch is that to fully access her operating system, Kojima had to touch a very private part of her body, causing her to enter a defense system mode where she explodes the entire floor and shuts down all the surrounding machines. With this obvious signal, our protagonist finally reunites with Chi. When she sees him, she moves into a trance and confesses that in this life, she only needs one special person who truly loves her, and when that moment comes, she will willingly reveal her darkest secret. With nothing more to say, she faints and now the protagonist can confront Kojima for everything he has done. Moreover, he intends to keep Kotoko since she is the only source of information about this madman's plans. All the later that same night, we see that the men in black are still lurking around the city. The important thing is that things return to normal the next morning. Both the protagonist and she can go back to enjoying their lives peacefully, leaving everything that happened yesterday as a mere nightmare. As the leaks go by, we see that this feeling doesn't change. The protagonist maintains his routine as a student during the day and a worker at night, and the same goes for Chi, who fearlessly works as a maid in Hiroyasu's bakery every morning. However, what has changed is the fact that now our protagonist visits Minoru's mansion more frequently. Although he doesn't want to appear weak in front of Chi, he's afraid that the same thing might happen again, and he won't be prepared to deal with it. Unfortunately, one day Minoru faints due to excessive work, and since they were making progress with an important part of the investigation into Chi's origin that day, they have no choice but to bring in Kojima to help them decipher the remaining information. As crazy as it may sound, this guy is not really evil. He is just overly obsessed with custom persokans. For this reason, he agrees to help them without asking for anything in return. In summary, with all the information they have gathered so far, the only way to truly find something valuable about the Chabots and their connection to Chi is by accessing the main organization's computer, which created all these machines. As expected, this server has super high security measures, and the only way to access it is by hacking the system with a supercomputer of an equally advanced level, or as a last resort, with a modified robot that has greater capabilities than the average Persicon. On top of this, there is also the risk of getting trapped in the network, and in the worst-case scenario, causing their software to disintegrate in the middle of the process, which would harm anyone daring to enter. The thing is, since the only one who meets these criteria is Yuzuki, we see that after a few hours, she decides to explore all of this on her own because she apparently feels that she has only been a complete disappointment to Minoru by not being like his late sister. However, to her misfortune, the men in black just connected to the server to prevent the central computer from being hacked, and they almost sent her straight to the other world. To understand better what happened during the process, an information cable fused, and thanks to this, the guys were able to retrieve their friend before she suffered any irreparable damage. The downside is that due to the data overload, a part of her files was lost. To be more precise, the data that Minoru had implanted in her for personality studies on his sister. Yuzuki asks him to please return that part of her software, but it's here where Minoru finally understands that it doesn't make much sense anymore. Just like his sister, she's an irreplaceable being who cannot be altered or molded to fill the void that will always be in his heart. With nothing more to say, they agree that from now on, they will start a new life together, in which each will be their own version and will not seek to imitate something they don't want to be. However, the tender moment ends right here because this is where the second part of the revelation comes in. Recall that a few months ago, Hibia met with Chi to give her a dress that she said was hers. Now, thanks to Yuzuki's brief access to the super company server, we can finally understand what she meant by those words. It turns out that this innocent lady was actually one of the first people to work on the development of the Chabot project. With this revelation, our protagonist rushes to his apartment to talk to Hibia about it. But unfortunately, she gets ahead of them and seems to have disappeared without leaving a single clue about her whereabouts. From here, things start to get complicated for the protagonist. As the weeks pass, the landlady continues to be missing, and to make matters worse, the mystery of the relationship between Yumi and Yuda resurfaces. In short, on a peaceful morning when the protagonist accompanied Chi to work, he suddenly noticed that someone was spying on them outside the bakery. Without hesitation, he starts chasing this person, and that's where he encounters Yumi again. But this time, she appears much more distraught than the last time at the park. With tears in her eyes, she asks the protagonist why all men are just as deceitful, 
referring to a romantic relationship, which apparently began with a dress detail that she was wearing today at work. To make it easier to understand, we need to go back a couple of years, a time when we see that this young woman was Ueda's assistant, ironically the same position that she now holds and even wore the same maid outfit that she wears now. During the time they worked together, the two of them got along very well to the point where one day Yumi fell in love and decided to confess her feelings. Fortunately, her love was reciprocated at that moment. However, after a few months, everything fell apart when she found out that the guy she liked had married a Persokan. Just like what happened to Shimizu, this turned into a trauma for her, as she has been afraid to fall in love with a person again, only to be replaced by a mere machine. As expected, in a mixture of jealousy and desperation, Yui severed all ties with her Hiroyasu, who surprisingly arrives at the protagonist's apartment to clarify what happened back then. The guy apologizes to Yumi and confesses that he didn't leave her because he preferred a robot over her, but in reality, what happened between them was real. As we saw earlier, Hiroyasu truly fell in love with his Persokan. Although this is initially challenging for Yumi to process, after a while of talking more calmly, they both decide to leave the past behind and why not give themselves a new chance to at least become good friends. Once this incident is resolved, our protagonist can return to the main issue because, as we remember, he still hasn't managed to contact Ibia. With all that has happened in these weeks, he's had little time to search for her or inquire about her whereabouts. However, while all of this was going on, we see that Minoru hasn't wasted a single moment. Apparently, his investigations have been yielding good results, and he has even managed to extract more information from the data Yuzuki stole when she connected to the network. This is where we encounter a third photograph, but in this case, it's very different from the rest because besides seeing Chi, we can perceive the presence of a new Persicon. Kojima tells the protagonist that Chi is hiding a much darker secret than he can imagine. To the extent that it has drawn the attention of someone very dangerous who goes by the name the King of Persicans. With this last revelation, we finally move on to the subjects dressed in black who actually have a rather peculiar designation. So let's just call them Zima as the guy and Dida as the girl. In a nutshell, Zima wants to prevent Chi from activating her final program, which is a very powerful weapon capable of incapacitated Persicans across the entire continent. The good news is that this guy isn't as reckless as he seems because he soon explains a theory. In summary, he suggests that if Chi can find happiness with a person she loves, the final program won't activate, and as a result, the rest of the world can continue living peacefully with their Persocons. In his particular case, this also benefits him because it allows him to stay together with Dita for all eternity. However, she doesn't share the same view, and in her mind, true peace will only be achieved when Chi is completely disintegrated. Obviously, the protagonist knows nothing about this, but if he genuinely wants to help Chi, he'll first have to be honest with his heart. Just as Shimbo tells him, if he can't even bring himself to say what he feels, he can't expect Chi to have the confidence to tell him her deepest secret. In case you haven't realized it yet, our protagonist has been in love with Chi all this time, but until now, he hasn't found a way to say it to her face because with everything he has experienced in recent months, he has begun to fear that he might end up experiencing a trauma similar to the one that people who had relationships with these machines went through. With this in mind, Shinbo makes an effort to prepare a private moment for them where they can be alone. But the bad news is that just as the protagonist was about to speak, Something inside him made him hesitate, and he decided to leave the apartment to get some fresh air. Oddly enough, thanks to this act of coordinates, when he descends the stairs, he encounters Hibia, who looks much more serious. She tells him to follow her to her lab to reveal the whole truth about Chi's secret. Once in the lab, she reveals that her late husband was the one who created the Chobits. In reality, the project began with two specimens, the first being Chi, whose real name is Elda, and the second being Freya, her older sister, who is the other Persicon we saw in the photo that Manoa found. Ibia explains that due to a medical condition, it couldn't have children, so her husband designed these two girls to be her daughters. They started with Freya, whom they trained and modified to have the closest thing to consciousness. Unbelievably, this experiment worked, but to their surprise, it also brought them the unexpected ability for her to feel love for humans, to the point where she fell in love with a real person. As the days went by and they failed to discover who that person was, they created Elda, a second girl who would serve as Freya's sister and companion. Elda had the same characteristics as the first version. However, it wasn't until a few years later that Hibia found out that Freya's first love was actually her own husband. It turned out to be a secret that her own daughter had kept because she knew it would be an unrequited love. Repressing such a powerful emotion within her limited brain capacity caused her software to not withstand the emotional strain of having a heart. In short, she wiped all her memories and reset her system completely. In the end, she chose to shut herself down, and since Elda shared her data in conjunction with her sister, it was unfortunate for our protagonist that he also had to suffer a lot of damage by losing his other half. Some time later, Hibia lost her husband and by that point, Chi's existence became a danger because she not only went into a mode where she secluded herself, waiting for someone with pure feelings to free her, but also her final configuration created a very powerful weapon that the project's collaborators called the Final Program. 
With the situation now clear, our guy returns to his apartment to confess his feelings to Chi. Ironically, it's Chi who interrupts him first to confess that she has loved him since the day they met, and that her heart only wants him to become complete again. As she speaks these words, her body begins to slowly illuminate, creating a shockwave that shuts down all the persokines in the city. Regardless, our guy doesn't pay much attention to these details because, at this moment, all that matters to him is confessing that he has loved her since the night he found her in the trash, and that this feeling will never change, no matter what problems they face in the future. These words complete Chi's unlocking state, and as she starts to levitate into the air, she murmurs between her lips that she has finally found the person she has been searching for all these years. With the sky illuminated by a star, the Persokans dressed in black arrive at the scene to witness the awakening of Machabit. As expected, Dida seizes the opportunity while Chi is vulnerable to try to disintegrate her system once and for all. Although Zima was initially helping with the hacking process, everything changes when the protagonist tells them that he doesn't care about the differences between humans and machines because his heart is truly in love with Chi, and he will do everything possible to protect the person he loves. These words not only pique Zima's interest in seeing how this story will end, but they also help unlock Chi's full potential. After fully illuminating, she generates a massive explosion that leaves the entire city without electricity. The downside is that when we regain consciousness, we learn that this woman is no longer Chi, but her other half, Freya, who was finally awakened after being locked away for so long. To make it easier to understand, a few days before she decided to end her life, she and her sister made a pact to safeguard all the data in Elda's hard drive. In case you're wondering, Chi did exist, but she was always part of the plan, destined to search for the ideal person, so that her sister could find a reason to live again. The Persica we got to know never gave herself a chance to love anyone else because these were things her system couldn't process clearly. And although she might have started to experience human emotions at some point, there would always be a part of that emotion that she would never truly understand. For this very reason, the Chi we knew chose to self-destruct, so that Freya would be the only consciousness left inside her body since she was supposed to be the only one of the two who could truly experience love. Although our guy tries to stop the reset, but Hibia says the keyword chobits, and in a matter of seconds, the computer girl that the proto loved was completely erased. In a last desperate attempt, our protagonist asks Freya to please say her final words to what little remains of Chi. All this time he couldn't answer what happiness is, but this time he feels that the best response is that happiness is being with the person you love, and whether it's in good times or bad, the essence of happiness is always being with the person you want to be with. With nothing more to say, we see that the final part of this story is rewritten with a new ending, in which she can awaken within her sister's heart and finally share that embrace she has been waiting for with the person she truly loves. What awaits them from here on won't be easy as humans still need to change their view of relationships with machines, but at least in our protagonist's case, this is nothing they haven't already experienced. This happiness that she feels can be transmitted among the consciousnesses of all the Persokans in the world. After a few months, we see that these simple computers have managed to prove that they can come close to having a heart, and just like the first Chabit did in her day, they have demonstrated that they too can truly love that special someone. Man.